Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I'm on the board of the International Humanistic Management Association, and this is Teaching Teachers to Teach Values. Um, and I'm, I'm the guest today. <laughs> My co-host is Elizabeth Castillo. Introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. Elizabeth Castillo out at Arizona State University. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So Elizabeth is going to be monitoring the chat room. So if you have any questions during the presentation, go ahead and ask them in the chat room and then Elizabeth uh, will ask them on your behalf. Um, I am going to start sharing my screen and get started with the slides. Here we go. All right. So. Um, this is about integrating ethics into the classroom. Uh, my company is called Humanist Learning Systems. And I want to make a real important caveat before we get started, because I know a lot of you are classroom teachers. I am not a classroom teacher. I am a consultant. I have online learning. I teach personal and professional development online. So when people come to me and they hire me, they are expecting explicitly humanistic training. I have the luxury of being explicit about humanistic values and I can invoke them openly without anybody batting an eye because if you come to humanist learning systems, you kind of have to expect humanist learning, right? Um, so just a caveat on that. And what I want to do, and by the way, that's my new book um, and it's for business schools. Um, so it, a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about there, that's one of the resources. So how do I approach the teaching of ethics in the classroom and explicitly humanist ethics in the classroom? Well, the first technique I use is called witnessing. So for those of you in um, the United States of America, you probably are familiar with these concepts. For those of you who are abroad, let me kind of explain them. Um, there's two different ways that people approach teaching people about religion and ethics. And one is called witnessing. That's where you say, um, you know, if you have a problem, this is how I would solve the problem, right? This is how I go about solving whatever this problem is. That's what's known as witnessing. This is what works for me. Proselytizing is something that people tend to not like because it's very kind of oppressive as, as opposed to witnessing, which is inviting you to learn how I might do it without imposing any expectation on you. Proselytizing is very much, this is how you should think. And that would be a no-no because a big part of, of humanism, right, is freedom of belief. And if you tell people they have to believe what you believe, then you're not honoring that core value of freedom of belief. The point of witnessing is to share uh, one way of thinking and to invite comparison, not to require that this person agree with you, but just that they, if I tell you this is how I think about the ethics of a particular situation, you are naturally going to think about whether or not you agree with me. And you're gonna think about what values, if I introduce the values I'm invoking, like I'm invoking freedom of belief in a classroom, you're going to be thinking to yourself, uh, okay, do I agree with that or not? And that's the point. It's not for me to tell you the best values. It's not for me to tell you the best way to do it. It's to say, this is how I do it. And by you comparing and contrasting how you might do it differently, I'm helping you be more explicit in what it is you value, even if it's not the same thing that I value. And that sharing and inviting comparison should be normalized, I think, in terms of how we talk about ethics. A lot of times ethics is very, impositional and meaning that this it's imposed on us from outside and what we should be encouraging students to do is to think for themselves and to do that encouraging them uh, to think and so when people read my book the humanist approach to happiness every once in a while i get someone who says i just didn't agree with it at all and my response is always mission accomplished right i got you to think explicitly about why you don't agree with me and you have good moral reasons to not agree with me that's fine i have accomplished my objective in getting the person to think about their own ethics and their own values and how they might invoke them in whatever the situation is so that's one of the techniques i use and i again i have the freedom to do this because when people come to me you know they know they're getting a humanist talking to them about what humanism is and how a, a humanist i.e me lives my life and integrates 
my values into whatever the, the problem is. <clears throat> the second technique I use is Socratic questioning. Now the core value here is critical thinking and the goal is to encourage thinking. And again, this goes back to the first one, witnessing. It's not about, for me as the educator, it's not about where they end up and what they conclude. It's more me helping them think through their own thinking without an objective of where they end up. Um, so in a classroom, this might involve asking questions about what is good and bad. What is a good solution to whatever the problem is? Is there a better solution to that problem? Good and bad are ethical terms. There's no way to avoid ethical thinking when you ask what is a good solution or what is a bad solution. And this makes it really applicable to any classroom you might be in. You're teaching computer programming, you can ask, is this a good program? Could we make this program better? What is good? What are all the metrics we could use to consider whether this is good or not? Right, because good is never just one metric. When we're talking about good, there's usually a hierarchy of things that are going on. And what are the various metrics we might use to determine whether something is good or bad? And you notice all, everything I just said was a question. I don't have an answer to those, and that's the point. The point is to let them think through the problem for themselves and let them define good for themselves and bad for themselves. And I do that by asking them questions and allowing them, not imposing my answers on them, but allowing them to discover for themselves uh, what they think is good and bad and to normalize the, the idea of integrating questions about what is good and bad into any decision they're making, right? And that should be part of how we normalize teaching ethics in any classroom, right? Is just ask the questions, is this good or bad? and allow them to have these conversations um, about what it is. And again, there's no right answer to these things. We're not imposing it. It's just how do we think critically and how do we integrate the ideas of ethics, good and what is good and bad, and what is it that we value into the conversation. The third technique I use is I encourage compassion and dignity. And the goal is individual growth and learning. What I try to do is I try to model dignity in these conversations. It's absolutely okay that people disagree. What's not okay is to uh, be angry about that disagreement, right? Um, I'm modeling concern for the well-being of people. So I, as the educator, will add in questions about dignity. How does this help people flourish? Does it help? Does it? Should we be concerned with that? Again, Socratic questions, but adding in the concerns of compassion and dignity into the moral conversation through Socratic reasoning or questioning is how I, I get people to start integrating these various values that they might invoke um, and, and as part of the conversation about um, the Socratic questioning on ethics. Again, it's absolutely okay to disagree. I think a lot of people are shocked when they disagree with me and I don't get upset and I, instead I go, yay, I succeeded. Um, because I think a lot of culture, a lot of our culture is that we have to be right and the other person has to be wrong. And that's not actually a very compassionate or dignified approach to having conversations about ethics. And it's really hurts, I think, the, our ability to have conversations about ethics because People do value different things. Well, for the most part, people value the same things, but how they weight those values is going to be different. And I think we need to be, make it okay for people to say, well, this is the value I'm invoking, and I think this is more important than this other value. And making it normal to have disagreements on that and modeling how to have those disagreements with, dis with dignity is the key. I actually don't, um, expect people to agree with me. I'm always shocked when they do and pleasantly surprised. I, I feel my goal as their teacher is to help plant the seeds. I, it's not, they're the ones that are going to tend that seed. They're the ones that are going to decide where that seed grows. My job is to plant it and to help them help it be okay to invoke compassion as one of the values we're talking about when we decide whether any given thing is good or not. 
that's kind of my core goal. Um, does this work for any topic? And the answer is yes. Let me give you chemistry as an example. Um, if I was going to talk about, say, sodium chloride, you know, salt, <laughs> something as mundane as salt, uh, why, why is salt important? What problems were people trying to solve when they started looking at salts? Why was it important? Why did scientists think it was so important to study salt? Right? Well, we can't live without it, right? We, our bodies shut down without salt. We die without salt. So there's a moral good in studying salt. There's a moral good in learning about salt. That leads us into, well, what did they find? Well, they found that we can't live without it. They, they found all sorts of things about electricity, conductivity, all sorts of things. And then, then we can come back to, well, how do we use this information to improve people's lives? Understanding that improve is a moral dimension to the conversation. And that brings us back into compassion and responsibility. So if you were to approach the teaching of um, salt in a chemistry class in this manner, I think the result would probably be some really deep learning and some deep thinking for people as they consider not only what did, what did the scientists learn about salt, what is, what is its chemical makeup and stuff, but why is this important, moral question, and how do we use this information, also a moral question. And in, embedded in that is the knowledge that we learn from the science, right? And I think you could do this with any topic. I mean, if you can do it with salt, you can pretty much do it with, with any topic. Um, what sort of resources do I use? A lot of the work I do is international. Um, so I use a resource called Humanistic Text. This is a uh, humanities resource where they take texts from throughout history and throughout different cultures that are humanistic in nature to invoke the various aspects of the humanist philosophy. Uh, I use this quite a bit. And the reason for this, uh, there's a book by Edward Said on uh, democratic critique of humanism. I think it's called On Humanism. And he talks about the importance of localizing the knowledge and the humanities so that people can uh, identify with that. People need to own their own identity in order to not be subsumed by other people's ideas and identities. So when I uh, you know, work with the black community, I'm talking about A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, and other people in the, human rights, uh, the civil rights movement. If I'm talking to people in China, I'm gonna be talking about Confucius. Um, just various types of humanism throughout history that are localized and can be owned by the individual. There's the same thing all across Africa. There's a bunch of uh, humanistic philosophies in Africa that I can draw on. If I'm talking to people in India, I might invoke Karvaka. So just knowing what these different um, traditions are that are humanistic in nature can help you reach more people with various backgrounds in a way that they will respond to uh, viscerally because they can own it it's theirs a lot of problems we have actually come from the imposition of the western traditions and there's nothing wrong with the western traditions i invoke them all the time but if it feels like imposition it won't be it won't be thought about in the same way as if it's something that's invoked that's native um one of the resources that's on this page is the 10 Humanist Commitments by uh, the Center for Education for the American Humanist Association. This uh, wheel uh, has, there's, I like it because there's no hierarchy to it. It's just a list of values. It's been translated into several languages, so it's, it's very useful internationally. And again, you could just take one of these and have a Socratic conversation about it in the context of whatever um, whatever the topic is you're talking about, humility. How does humility play into whatever the work is that you're doing? How does uh, responsibility play into whatever the work is that you're teaching them about? Environmentalism. And again, the point is not to um, have an end, give them the end of where they should end up, but to help them get on the path where they can think for themselves about what matters to them as an individual so that they then have the confidence to invoke that for themselves in whatever situations they find them in later. 
The other two resources um, are, uh, I have on my website a list of books uh, and also videos that you could draw on. Um, other resources, there's Humanist International, which used to be the International Humanistic Ethical Union. They have a list of values that you could draw on. Actually, it doesn't really matter what the list of values you use is any list of values. You could use the Buddhist list, you could use the Christian list. It doesn't matter as long as you're inviting discussion on a value in the context of what it is you're doing um, using the Socratic questioning. And if people ask you and you feel empowered to do it or it's appropriate in the situation you're in, you could witness, just never proselytize because that robs people of their autonomy and their freedom of thought and their ability to think for themselves, which is what we are trying to help them do. The end goal is people who can think about ethics and integrate ethics into their thinking, and you don't wanna rob them of that by imposing on them. Another resource is Ideas Beyond Border. My friend uh, Faisal started this, and they started basically translating a lot of banned books into Arabic, Farsi, and Kurdish to help uh, transmit ideas and love their work. So uh, that's it. That's how I do it. <laughs> um, so questions and thoughts, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, thank you so much, Jen. That was really wonderful, um, and you were so clear and concise about it. Um, for everyone, if you want to ask any questions, just feel free to type them in the chat box, and then we will go ahead and um, I'll, I'll call on you. I'll unmute you when, uh, to ask the question. Um, but for now, I'll start with some of the questions you all asked when you registered. Um, so Violetta um, wanted to know uh, value-based education evaluation in schools. Is there a way to apply this framework to know whether an ethical program is working, say character development or? So that's a really good question. And I'm not sure that I'm the right person to answer because I'm not an academic or a scientist that studied this. Uh, my book, The Humanist Approach to Happiness, is in use in some curriculums for the UUA for character development um, and at the Royal Military College of Canada for leadership skills. Um, I think like, the idea of metrics is kind of annoying to me, to be honest. Um, I'm not really concerned about where someone is at any given place and time. My goal as an educator is to get them on a growth path for themselves, right? So if I've helped them um, either own a part of their morality, whatever that morality is, then I consider that a win. The more people that feel comfortable uh, acknowledging their values and invoking them in a polite <laughs> sort of witnessing sort of way, I think the world would be better off if we could do that. But in terms of metrics, that's not my expertise. Um, well, for your own coursework, do you do any like pre and post evaluation or, you know, the organization? Oh, that yeah. So um, I do have quizzes at the end of every, so my, my education is online learning and it usually consists of a video lecture and then there's a quiz to make sure they paid attention right, um, that they heard the concepts and learned them. Um, but I don't ever uh, judge people on where their moral life is. Like that would be rude to me. I don't so, know that would be appropriate. <laughs> basically, you're echoing back, you're not telling them what to think, so you're not measuring what they think, but it's right. more of the developmental process and the, the, the metacognition capacity. Right. That you're looking at and 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 the reality is everybody's in a different place when they come to me um and what they need from me is going to be different so where they are as an individual is where they are as an individual like my goal is not to get them to the end state it's to give them the tools so that they can get themselves to where they want to go wherever that is mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Um, now I'm gonna um, scoot over to Ron Russell who has a couple questions. Um, so Ron, I'm gonna unmute you so you can ask the question you, chat, you typed in the chat box. Sure, sure. Um, so what are some common pitfalls to uh, avoid or dangers to be aware of in teaching values? Because uh, it can get kind of um, emotional. Right. Um, so the big pitfall, I think, is religion writ large. It doesn't matter what the religion is. 
Um, a lot of people associate their religion with their values and they, they associate their values with their religion. And so they're not used to having conversations on values just for the sake of having values. Um, and it's also possible that some of the values might be in conflict with one another. Um, as a humanist, I view uh, values as situational, not absolute. And there, I could go into why that is. And I actually have courses on why I think that this is an appropriate way to approach ethical discussions. But people who have never had um, an ethical education outside of their religious institution may have a lot of discomfort with um, starting these conversations. So the, the value that I invoke for myself to help them is compassion, to meet them where they are with whatever they need. Um, part of education should be uncomfortable, um, but not so much that they shut down and like just refuse to participate. Right? Um, and so that's the balance you have to walk is to make it okay for them to, to have whatever their thoughts is. And if they wanna dig in on their values, that's perfectly fine you know, that's where they are and that's what matters to them. As long as they can articulate it and um, clarify it for themselves, I feel like mission is accomplished. But the big value that I use to help navigate these things is compassion. And the other tool is, is to make sure that it's clear that people are speaking for themselves and that there's no necessarily right or wrong way to think about this. And that that seems to help smooth that over. I've given, you know, I teach explicitly secular humanism, like non-theist humanism. And I've given talks all over the world to people of a variety of faith of backgrounds, and they usually can feel themselves in what I'm talking about. I mean, I've had a preacher's wife tell me that an atheist helped her be a better Christian, right? And it's because I didn't tell her what she was thinking was wrong. Right, I just witnessed the life, ex my life experience that she could read into it because we're all human. We all have common experiences. And so the, I, I think the, the, the humility and the compassion and the dignity of, of treating everyone as equal and valid, even if you disagree with them, you're not just helping that person own their own dignity in what is a very uncomfortable situation for them. But you're also modeling them that this is possible. So that's how I would do it. Um, and Ron, stay with me because I wanna get to the question you asked at the registration, which was um, how to appeal to these ideas emotionally instead of intellectually. So I think Ron's question now, one of the bits was that people can get emotional where they kind of shut down. Um, and then you help them get to an intellectual where they're thinking about their thinking. But then like, how do they integrate it into their heart, which is sort of like the shift I think you heard about the Christian pastor's wife that- um, Right. Um, I, I guess the thing is I don't focus on that, right? I'm not looking at the end state. I, it's not my business where they end up. That's their business and their decision. And they could take everything they learned from me and go and do the exact opposite, right? It, that's their choice. They are an autonomous individual with freedom of belief and freedom of thought. And that's my primary value when I talk about ethics. And if you're not okay with other people taking parts of, you know, I, I'm very, if you've read one of my books, you will see up front, it is okay to disagree with me. It is okay to take pieces of what I'm talking about and integrate it and ignore the pieces you don't like. That's perfectly okay. Um, I trust that most humans have an emotional life that if something is resonating with them that is an emotional experience for them. Uh, our, our values are often emotion-based anyways. Um, what we consider good is often emotion-based anyways. So I trust that the people will take this information and use it for good um, because most people will. So I don't really worry about that end state. I don't worry about needing, I don't need them to take it into their heart right? My goal when I teach humanism is to make sure they understand what the philosophy is and that they for themselves have decided what they agree with and don't agree with. It's not my job to tell them what to agree with. 
mm-hmm. or what they should be feeling or thinking. The more of the process than the- It's, more, it's process oriented, right. Mm-hmm. Um, Hannah had a question about wanting to share the slide. So just to let oh. everybody know, we are recording this and um, it, we will send the link out um, afterwards. Um, and Hannah, was there a specific slide that you wanted to, um, her to, to go to that you wanted to discuss? I'll unmute you right now. Hello. Hi, Hannah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, so beginning from the technique one, the techniques one and two, I was unable to get them down completely. So okay. I would like to just go over them again. Thank you. Sure. Um, and I will be putting these slides, um, previous, previous, I will be putting these slides up on SlideShare so they'll be available there as well. So technique one was witnessing as opposed to proselytizing. The core value is freedom of belief and the goal is to share and invite comparisons as opposed to imposing ideas. Um, The second technique was Socratic questioning. And again, it's about critical thinking and encouraging people to think for themselves, not dictating what they think or what they believe. And then the third one was encouraging compassion and dignity. So hold on, not sharing. Thank you. So Leslie Kirsch, when she registered, asked a question, um, what suggestions do you have for principles-based ethics education in business school programs with a heavy compliance focus drawing from professional codes of conduct? Sure. Um, I would, if I was required to teach a course on professional codes of conduct and I wanted to integrate ethics, I would take each aspect of the code and have a conversation about why people think this is a good or bad code. And that's the ethical conversation. Why would this be necessary? You know, was it because someone did something stupid or is it because people are harmed by this? And I would have an ethical conversation, Socratic ethical conversation about every single aspect of the code so that people not only A, learned the code, but that um, they now have opinions about it and that they thought through it ethically. That's how I would approach it. Um, so pedagogically, a lot of this is online, and I know you do online. So how, are you able to do the Socratic process in a, in a virtual or online setting? Sure. Um, and the way I do it is I, Soc- I Socratically question myself, right? If you're an educator for any length of time and you're teaching a single subject for any length of time, you know what questions come up, right? This, this questions, the most common questions are not going to be a mystery to you. So I build that into uh, the presentation itself, and I ask and answer the questions as we go through. But because it's, it's like kind of one, uh, like a video presentation is not a QA, and um, it's just a video with some you know, quizzes, right? But the way I think of the program is that I start up here with the big question, and I Socratic question myself down to, why does this really, really matter? Um, and if, again, I have a course on Socratic questioning, but also on reality-based decision-making where I explain this process. And then once you know what your real problem is, as opposed to a proxy problem, your real problem, then you can start building up a solution that will really work based on the metrics of morality that were identified in the Socratic process. So I, I think about this as a U-curve, right? The Socratic questions help us dive down to what really matters And then it also helps us identify the core values and that helps us build up to a solution that will hopefully really work. So what is our real problem? Why does it really matter? And what will really work to solve it is kind of what's always in my head. Um, And the questions I use in my courses are drawn from questions I've received in a live presentation or via email or whatever. So I'm always addressing what at least some people are concerned about. (laughs) And then um, the, so it sounds like a lot of it is then just getting to the problem framing, right? Is that people, you know, they diagnose it with a certain way, but it turns out that's a pretty superficial. And so you, I know there's an exercise called the five whys where you write people down. So is that? Oh, I love that one. And I, I, it's, it's like, why does this matter? Well, why does that matter? Well, why does that matter? Well, why does that matter? Usually you get down to something uh, that if we don't fix this, people will die. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right? And that's your real problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've done this with so many different groups that, you know, and it's always kind of funny to me, like, 
they'll say, well, how do I get everybody to agree with me? And I'll be like, well, why do you want people to agree with me? So I can fix the problem. <laughs> well, why do you want to fix this problem? You know, and I, it just gets them down to where they, they identify. And a lot of times what they thought was important is actually what I would call a proxy problem. It's standing in for the real problem and they can't actually fix the proxy problem. Like you can't get people to agree with you. And why would you try that would violate freedom of belief, right? So, but if you can get down to the core problem, you can often solve it with very little effort what's, whatsoever. Um, let me give you an example. I got evolution into the Florida State Science Standards with three people, <laughs> right? Because I, I identified what we really wanted and it was not, we don't need to change people's minds. We need to make sure the standards are written that include evolution. And um, because I got rid of the extraneous stuff, I was able to focus on, okay, well, how actually are the standards written? And that was a very interesting answer. <laughs> that allowed us to get um, the right people in the right places before the process even started. So. Um, that's a great example. Um, not to put you on the spot, this might be like over uh, out of scope, but like, so how might this transfer to the political domain? Oh, it um, transfers there all the time. Right? Well, not what, not from the news I, channels I listen to. <laughs> so. um, you know, again, I think Socratic questioning helps people because even if they're not in a place to listen if i'm in a place to listen and you know i'm not i don't enter any socratic quest conversation with a goal in mind what i my goal is to learn how this other pe person thinks and why they think this way and that that's me comparing and tra contrasting what i think against what they think. So this is something I practice, right? It's not me imposing on them. I wanna know why, why does this matter to you? Why are you concerned with this issue? Is this really an issue? And I might just you know, plant the seeds of doubt through the Socratic question. I'm not telling them what's right or wrong. I'm not telling them they're wrong. I'm not telling them they're a horrible person or evil or anything like that. I'm just asking some questions to uh, explore their moral reasoning. And what I have found when I do this is there's always moral reasoning, right? No one is, very few people are like fundamentally evil. Like I, I think the number of people on the planet Earth right now who are fundamentally evil is less than five people, right? Everybody else is just a normal human being trying to get by. What they know or don't know to be true might be influencing them. They might be under the influence of uh, propaganda, whatever it is. But by exploring their moral reasoning, I can find that common ground of what we agree on. And once we have those agreements on what we agree on, then I can, if I'm feeling like it, or I feel like there's an opening there, it depends, most of the time I don't, but um, I might start exploring those areas of common moral ground and emphasize that we're not so far apart, right? And just that act of, agreement that we're actually not that far apart can have tremendous impact on how conversations flow from there on out. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. Thank you so much, Jen. I, I wish the media relations would take your course. <laughs> Learn the process. Um, yeah. I want to get you a, a question that Chris Tsort asked. Um, he had to check out, but he did um, send in, uh, how do you navigate pushback on the normative dimension of ethics um, as who gets to decide what counts as ethical? Um, well, I the answer I... is that uh, the individual will, will decide for themselves what is ethical and what isn't ethical. And that's the only place where that, like, if you want to impose this, you will fail because individual humans have individual thoughts and their brains are encased in their heads and they will think whatever they're going to think. All right, so where is, and I think this kind of annoys people. So there's a difference between situational ethics, absolute ethics, and how people with different ideas on whether ethics are situational or absolute impact how they think. There are a lot of people out there that want hard and fast rules and they want their morality to just be codified and everyone to agree with them. To me, that's a fool's errand. It's never going to happen. And so right off the bat, I know I'm dealing with someone who is immensely frustrated, right? Just immensely frustrated with the world. Um, and 
this is where I start invoking my, my compassion for them, right? I don't need to argue with them. My goal at this point is to help them cope with uncertainty. The, the, the maddening reality that ethics are <laughs> fundamentally uncertain <laughs> and um, floating and moving around and situational. It's maddening to a lot of people. So I think invoking your own compassion to help them cope a lot of what I do is like there's VUCA, right? Volatility, uncertainty, uh, I forget what the C is, chaos. Complexity. <laughs> Complexity and stuff. A lot of people really, 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 really struggle with that. And it gets them really upset. So when I'm dealing with some, that's how I view them. This is a person who's struggling, right? How different is my approach to them if I'm viewing them as someone who's struggling than if I'm viewing them as an adversary? Mm -hmm right? Someone who needs absolute ethics and wants that certainty of ethical reasoning needs to be helped to cope with the, the fundamental uncertainty of ethical reasoning and the flawed nature of ethical reasoning. Um, so this gets to a question that Brandy asked when she registered, which is, um, what teaching modalities and trainings are available on the, for the process of developing teachers to teach and practice emotional intelligence in engagement and communication? Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're doing this series, right, is to bring in different educators to talk about how they do it. I'm not sure that there's actually a lot of resources out there to teach people how, teach teachers how to deal with the emotional lives of their students, which can vary dramatically depending on, I know we have K through 12 people here. We have, um, you know, college educators, we have consultants. The emotional lives of where your students are is gonna impact how they learn. Um, so I do think emotional intelligence is important. Um, and I'm not aware of a huge number of resources to help teachers with this, but that is one of the reasons why we created this series for how to teach teachers to teach ethics is to at least start creating some of the content by doing interviews with other educators. Um, yeah, because she was specifically interested in the primary levels, um, yeah. you know, K through six. And um, so you don't, you don't know for sure, but it, it, it sounds like you, you're pretty emotionally evolved and that you're, you don't get defensive. You ask, come in with a questioning attitude. Right. And I think that's, you know, I think this is where humanism helps, right? Is if someone is acting out um, or struggling, the humanistic approach is to view that person compassionately as an individual with dignity and worth, that they're not just acting out, that there's, there's a causal element to whatever is going on. And until you understand why, and that might be five layers ago, you know, stuff you don't even know about. You know, do you know if the kid is homeless? Do you know if they're being abused? Do you, you know, there's so many things you don't know um, and they might not tell you, right? Um, because they might be embarrassed or there might be other issues going on or they might not have made good decisions. And with little kids, like they, they don't have the ability to really articulate uh, complex emotions and causal reasonings why. So I, I always feel like my default is when I'm encountering something like this is to remind myself to be compassionate and to treat this person with dignity and see what happens from there. Um, Linda Cantor had a, a suggestion when she registered. She says, I'm interested in ways of integrating ethics and mindfulness practice. So like, do you meditate or do you, br how do you bring mindfulness into your practice and how could, you know, teachers bring it into theirs? Um, so to me, you know, that is about contemplation, about creating space for quiet and to think about your own reactions. And, and this is my practice as a humanist is very much a personal practice. Um, and here I am witnessing, right? <laughs> um, but what I think to myself is when I find myself getting defensive or when I'm being triggered emotionally in a way that I don't like, the practice is to stop myself and think about why I'm responding this way and to consciously reframe in using compassion and dignity as my guide. And this is something that it's a personal practice. It's something I have to practice a lot. What I found though is over time, as I try to explicitly live 
humanistically is that the more I practice reframing my mindset in difficult situations, the easier that reframing becomes. And so that is a mindfulness practice. It's not meditation per se, but I think we can help each other get there by encouraging, um, acknowledging the emotions. Uh, when I do this for myself, I like acknowledge my emotions. I'm upset. Why am I upset? Right. And I Socratically question myself to help myself calm down. If you're Socratically questioning a child who's in the mo middle of an emotional breakdown, it is not going to work. Right. Um, often people have to calm down first. And so that is where the validating of the emotions that they're experiencing is. A lot of times people just want to be validated. It is okay that you're upset. Whatever just happened was upsetting. How else are you supposed to respond? And often, as soon as that happens, that that validation occurs, you can see a visible relaxation of the tension. They're being heard, they're being uh, treated with dignity and compassion. And once they're calm enough to have these conversations, then you can start saying, so, you know, have those, uh, I understand this other person upset you, but your response to them, you know, you have a variety of choices, right? They're them and they upset you and they did something bad, but what are you going to do about it? What is the best way to approach that? Do you want to be like them or do you want to, you know, respond, you know, more humanistically and compassionately and whatever? And those, that, that's when those can, conversations can occur. But I find with myself, the, the main thing I have to do for myself is to validate my own emotions so that I can have that conversation with myself. And then I have to practice it. Right, that's one of my mantras is, this is upsetting, that doesn't mean I have to be upset. Exactly. Right? So, and then that helps you get to a new level. And I don't have to respond in an upset way because that might not help me fix the problem. In fact, it probably won't help me fix the problem. So as long as I'm focused on really fixing the underlying problem, um, I can make decisions about whether to engage or not engage depending on what my actual goals are, as opposed to just reacting in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so this was my question when I registered. Um, is there a core value that you emphasize? I mean, you talk about a weighting of values, a hierarchy of values. Um, you know, I, I love the slide with the 10 humanist values. Um, is, is there one that's like stands above all or are they um, equally okay. weighted? So for me, as a humanist, my core value is compassion and dignity, dignity and worth of all individuals and the compassion that helps me acknowledge that. Um, compassion for self, compassion for others, compassion for the world. So for me, that's my primary value. Um, and it, it, I'm not alone in that. I think there was a study on global ethics a decade or so ago, maybe two decades ago, dating myself. Um, but they, they surveyed people around the world of a variety of different backgrounds, a variety of different faith backgrounds. And there actually is a trinity of values that people place above others. And the top of those tends to be compassion. So compassion, um, honesty, and responsibility is like the top three. And then compassion is usually the tiebreaker, but not for everybody, but for the majority. And that's actually how, that's actually my, <laughs> my, you know, my, my trinity as well. Um, so one of the questions I had is, is, is how do you make the, or do you make the values explicit? So you talked about witnessing, for example, and you're inviting people to think and share their experiences. Do you explicitly talk about, okay, this is my core value is freedom of be belief? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just did that in the presentation, right? I, all of my slides had me invoking the values that I'm invoking. I do do this explicitly. But I do it in a witnessing way. And, and through this presentation, you've heard me say, this is how I do it. This is what I think. And at no point have I said, you need to do it my way because you don't need to do it my way. This is how I do it. This is what works for me. Um, but I do it actively invoke these values. This is why lists of values are so helpful. It doesn't matter where you get this list from. You can invoke it and invite discussion on it. Um, and it's okay that people disagree, but if you have a list, you can say, well, which of these values do you think is mo most important? Not because you, ha you want them to choose the same thing as you, but because just the act of considering weighting the values um, is a useful act and it encourages critical thinking around values later on in their life because you've normalized the idea of weighting values. 
um, so that one isn't because the values, like if we were going to talk about the death penalty, right? The, the standard question is, it is, is it okay to kill one person to save like a thousand people? Well, the question around the death penalty invokes about five or six values that everyone holds. And if you hold one of them to the exclusion of the other, then you're not necessarily weighting the pros and cons. And people do that because it's easier to just pick one and then use it absolutely. But that's not really good critical thinking, right? Critical thinking is the ability to look at multiple values and say, um, this is the one I think is most important or choosing the greater of two goods or the lesser of two evils. There's a lot of nuance in it. And so helping people get comfortable with that and normalizing that, I think that alone would have a tremendous positive impact on the world. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think so often our policy discussions get stuck is because we never get to the values piece of it, right? Is or we're in the values piece, but we're only allowed to discuss one of the values as opposed to five of the values. Um, and so, because I've, I've never met anyone across the political spectrum that doesn't invoke values. Uh, we might not agree on what those values are, and we might not agree on the hierarchy of the values, but it's, we only really come into a problem when, per, when someone's only willing to talk about one value. And that stifles the conversation because there's only the one value and it has to be applied absolutely. So normalizing the, the, the weighting of values um, in a classroom setting in, in hypothetical situations, I think would have a tremendous positive impact on people's ability to think about ethicals in a more rational way and, and also understanding how they can think about it. And it's okay to weigh you know, compassion against expediency, right? That's a conversation that happens in business schools all the time. That's a conversation we're having on COVID right now, right? So um, if, we, if we don't help people learn how to do that waiting, um, I think we're handicapping them into the future. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, Natasha has asked a question. So um, Natasha, could you unmute and, and ask it? Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you. So I was just wondering if you could speak to a little bit about um, how we handle this kind of teaching of ethics and values within the classroom space and this um, notion of like reward and sanction that we see kind of in the schooling systems. So what are your thoughts around that? I'm not sure I completely understand the question because I'm not a classroom teacher. <laughs> so I don't know um, necessarily what it is you're responding to to be able to, to help. That was a very I need help understanding the question. <laughs> so how we kind of facilitate in a, in a classroom where we're, where we're looking at our students kind of character education or, or value-based education of, you know, this is a good thing you did or that was kind. Um, you know, even in parenting where we see kind of reward sure. charts and things like that, um, you know, is this the right way forward or is it something that we should be kind of feeling that is kind of this is essentially morally right or innate? Um, but yeah, just what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and with kids in particular, um, you know, a lot of, so my, one of my backgrounds is that I, I was a dolphin trainer, and so I've been trained in behavioral conditioning, and I actually integrate behavioral conditioning techniques in most of my education programs, specifically the programs on how to get a bully to stop bullying using behavioral conditioning. Like, how do you uh, reinforce to get them to stop? Um, and the answer is that there's, we are being conditioned all the time by the conditions we're in. So th these are called natural uh, rewards and responses. Uh, but uh, Viktor Frankl, I think, said we, the, the great thing about being human is we don't have to be conditioned by our conditions. We can override our conditioning. But in general, there's, there's three responses to any stimulus. There's a positive response where the animal likes it, a negative response where the animal didn't like it, and a neutral response where it's neither good or bad. We are doing this all the time. We can't not do it. It's gonna happen. So I think part of the obligation of a teacher is to be very cognizant of how their responses to students are shaping their students' behavior. Um, I, I, to me, this would be an ethical requirement. And unfortunately, I don't think a lot of teachers are taught these things, um, but, just simple 
simple ways that we respond and smile to some students and don't smile at other students can have a tremendous impact on what's happening in the classroom. It's, it's kind of insane. And, and not to get you like in your head too much, but just this goes back to the mindfulness practice, being aware of what your triggers are and what your responses are so that you can consciously choose to positively respond to the behavior you want and maybe use a neutral response to the behaviors you don't want as opposed to a negative response. Um, this tends to yield better, better behavioral shaping later on. I think pretending that we're not behaviorally shaping um, the people we're interacting with is naive, is, is what I would say to that. So the, the question is how do we do it responsibly? And doing it responsibly means um, doing it with dignity and compassion and being cognizant about how our behavior impacts others and then using, focusing on only two of these things, the positive and the neutral response because negative reinforcement is so incredibly problematic and causes so many artifacts of weird behavior later on that it's not something, um, negative reinforcement tends to create superstitious behavior. <laughs> <laughs> just to put it bluntly. Um, and so you, you want to kind of focus on the positive and the neutral. And, and with neutral, you, um, you respond and redirect. So let me give you an example with a kid. Um, it's really important that parents have the ability to stop a kid from doing something that might injure them, injure another kid, or maybe kill them. So if you have a kid at the Grand Canyon and they're running towards the edge and you say stop, you want them to stop. Like, right, and so what usually happens with parents is they tell the kid to stop, the kid stops, and then the parent releases all this anxiety about what just happened that made them yell stop. And what the kid learns is not that stopping is good. They learn that stopping actually causes a bad response in my parents. And so they're gonna wanna stop less. And if we instead thank the child for stopping, um, we would actually have kids that respond to verbal commands a lot better and be a lot more positive about it. So what usually happens is we issue uh, a signal like stop and then we negatively reinforce the child for properly responding to it. And then that is what is causing all these issues. And if we just take the time to step back and positively re reinforce them for stopping and then encourage them positively how they might interact in the situation better. I think we can help kids learn how to self-regulate better. Mm -hmm. And again, the goal is self-regulation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like eventually they will tell themselves stop and stop and reward themselves for stopping and then re redirect. So it's a process for increasing the capacity for self-regulation. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get to Rizwan, who has a few questions. And um, Rizwan, I'm going to um, unmute you so you can ask them yourself, okay? Um, Sorry. I'll thank you so much. Sorry, I think I've unmuted myself now. Okay. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much. You know, it's been a really uh, informative session and, and enlightening. Um, I just had a couple of questions in terms of how are we defining um, or how do we define the difference between morals and ethics? And that was my first question. Um, and um, yeah, so that was my first question. The second question is, you know, when you're talking about the hierarchy of values and how do we, um, you know, particularly when we're dealing with children, uh, looking at the idea of teaching them um, some values and some core values to us, the idea of caring, generosity, compassion, sharing. What happens when society doesn't necessarily um, place those uh, in terms of a hierarchy and I'll give you just an example and just kind of off the top of my head but you know uh, on the playground for example I've got two young boys and we're teaching them the idea of turn taking and caring for other people so what we then do is if we see somebody else waiting we'll give them a turn and then we get our kids off but that's not always reciprocated so when society doesn't necessarily value those same values that we have how do we make sure that our kids aren't left behind or seeing, you know, what's the point of doing this then? Sure, sure. Uh, so okay. those are my questions. So the first question was the difference between morals and ethics. Um, I'm going to just answer it the way I think about it. It might not be the correct <laughs> answer, but this is how I make the distinction. Morals is my set of values, right? The ethics is how I apply those values in a given situation, if that helps. So morals are the values, ethics are the application of those values. 
Perfect. Easy, okay. simple. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, in the in terms of what you're talking about, um, the thing I was always taught from my father, and I can't tell you how many times he told this to me, is life isn't fair. It's just not. And he didn't say that to discourage me, right? He he told me that to get me off of the it needs to be fair. This isn't fair. And um, you know, the the question, of course, it's not fair. It's like <laughs> It's not going to be fair. Um, so how do you, the question is, what do you do about it not being fair? What are your choices, right? No, this isn't fair. And the other teacher isn't um, enforcing the same rules I'm enforcing as a teacher. Um, so how should we respond to this? And then that opens up a Socratic question with the kids. Like what, how should, how do you want to respond to this? Do you want the teachers to step in? Um, do you want to reframe what you're doing? Maybe you could co-play with them. Um, maybe you could push them and then encourage them to take turns, whatever it is. But it opens up the conversation. And I think this is an important life skill, right? Is if we don't want people going through life feeling entitled, right? but we also don't want people to go through life feeling victimized, right? And so the way to help, to me, to help that and what I do with my own son is, is okay, so what are we going to do about this unfairness? Yeah, do you want to fight this? Do you want to go play a different game? Um, what else could we do? That opens up a conversation where I give the child agency and dignity and um, authority over themselves mm -hmm. and reinforce the positive values I want to see in them as they decide what they're going to do. And so if they say, well, I want to do this, I want to push the kid off the slide. <laughs> Right, um, because that might be their honest response. Right? I want to put them off the swing and take the swing back. Um, you know, yeah, I get that. <laughs> I would feel the same way. But what would be the outcomes of that, right? And as you help them think through these things, you're teaching them how to think through for themselves. That these are valid questions to ask of themselves later. So that's how I would do it. But um, you know, everybody's different. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for responding to that and really insightful. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, so we've just got two minutes left. Oh, we up. have two minutes. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, I didn't realize we were so long. Did we conclude at nine? Um, yeah, yeah it, it concludes at the hour. Um, so real quick, the next teaching the teachers is going to be Monsieur Lodi uh, from the Entrepreneurship School in New Delhi, um, I think on September 24th. Do we want to do one last question or... Um, I don't have any other questions, um, so I wanted to see, do you just have like a key takeaway that you want to leave us with to bring it home? Don't be afraid to talk about ethics in your classroom. Don't be afraid to introduce these questions of what is good and bad and how might we make things better. Something might be good and maybe we could make it better because it's in those questions of uh, that we find innovation, that we find empowerment, um, that we find autonomy. And so don't be afraid to help your students with these questions. I think a lot of people shy away from this because um, they're not comfortable with it themselves. And I think we just need to get over that and, and understand that if, if you're having a conversation about mechanical engineering, yes, it's a place to introduce the concept of ethics because there's better solutions and less better solutions. And that itself is a moral conversation. So don't be afraid to have these conversations and to introduce them um, into your classroom. Regardless of subject, huh? Regardless of subject, yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Jen. That was really amazing. And um, you just made things so crystal clear and, and um, actionable. So I, th I think everybody shares our gratitude for you taking your time to be with us today. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining. Um, we do these webinars monthly and we um, encourage you to um, re attend regularly and then we can start building community. Right. And tomorrow we have Anka Winchenbach uh, uh, on our uh, Humanistic Learning Professionals program. So, um, 